I'm Roger Giboni, and I'm the founder and chief engineer here at Rogers High Fidelity. And I want to introduce you to episode one of a new video podcast series we're going to start. And we're going to use this podcast series to talk about um, issues that are in our hobby, in our industry. Um, we're not necessarily going to focus on Rogers High Fidelity. Um, we'll talk about it from time to time. Uh, but we're going to talk about things that are of interest to us as audio files. Um, I want to uh, take this opportunity, episode one, to introduce you to myself. For those of you that haven't met me at the shows, um, I, uh, I wanted to give you a little bit of my background. I'm not really good about talking about myself, but I thought, uh, you know, based on how we go in the future and what topics we talk about in the future, it might be helpful to have a little background about me. Um, let me tell you that we design these video podcasts to be a community. Um, so I want to encourage you to write to me, uh, write to us, um, with questions, issues, topics you'd like to see covered, because um, we'd like to cover things that are of interest to you. Um, and we don't necessarily need to talk about electronics. I, uh, I got a, we're going to invite some special guests to join us. Um, one of the people is going to come talk to us about bourbons and high-end analog watches. So we'll talk about things that are of interest to all of us um, in this luxury audio community. Again, I want to I want to invite you to write to me with your questions um, and topics you'd like to see covered. And there's a couple ways you can reach me. You can get get to us at info at rogershighfidelity.com. You can write to me personally at roger at rogershighfidelity.com. Um, or you can reach us on our online chat, which is accessible right there on our website. So I want to talk a little bit about who I am um, and some of my educational experiences and why that's important um, and some of my work experiences. Uh, first off, I, I need to open with confessing that I'm really not an audiophile by, uh, by experience. Uh, obviously, after 10 years in the business, um, I'm learning the audiophile business. I learn something new every day about it. Uh, I've learned the importance of what you can hear, but I like to take into account my engineering background and that is I need to be able to measure it as well. So measurement and hearing kind of play an important uh, yin and yang in our design business here. Um, I should tell you that I am an engineer by education. Uh, there aren't a lot of us in the audio industry. I think you as consumers of audio equipment deserve um, uh, formally educated engineers to, to be designing and manufacturing your equipment. Um, and uh, you pay a lot of money for that equipment, and hopefully you'll reap the benefits of, uh, of uh, sound engineering experiences. Um, I have a bachelor's degree and a master's degree uh, in electrical engineering. I also did all my coursework, my PhD in electrical engineering. I went to Drexel University in Philadelphia, and then I spent some time in business school. I went to University of Pennsylvania's Wharton Business School um, for some postgraduate work. Um, so I like to try to bring that into play with the equipment that we design and build here for you. Um, my work experience that drives our, um, our design philosophies here is primarily comes from the fact that I spent 15 years in the aerospace industry, um, both with General Electric and with RCA, designing and building satellite communications equipment and uh, aerospace and defense equipment. Um, and why is that important to audio uh, equipment because we're building equipment that is designed with the absolute best components that the industry has to offer because we've learned about those through the aerospace experience but also we build extremely robust designs designs that will take use and in some cases abuse and still come back and play the way they were designed to play I think one of the most poignant um, work experiences I had was actually before I was in the aerospace industry. When I was in high school and my first years in college, I worked in a TV repair shop. Um, some of you are old enough to remember that we used to fix TVs and not throw them away. Um, we kind of use that philosophy with our audio equipment as well. Um, but what I learned in that um, experience was not so much the technical experience of repairing televisions, but um, the experience of customer service, the importance of customer service, and the importance of entertainment electronics in people's lives. 
So even though you might have to take a television out of someone's house to, house to repair it, it might be gone for a week or so, um, it's an important aspect of their life and it needs to be treated with the due respect and dignity um, associated with that transaction. Uh, consequently, when we bring equipment in here for repair, when, when units come back to us for service, um, we have a standing rule, no unit stays in the shop for service for more than 24 hours. There are very few things that we can't repair in a few hours here um, on the gear that we build and design um, at Rogers High Fidelity. So we have a standing rule, no equipment stays here longer than 24 hours when it's in for service. As I mentioned to you, um, I had some experience, uh, primary experience, in the aerospace industry. Um, and uh, we designed and built um, the communications and tracking equipment for the NASA Space Station. We built the uh, Aegis uh, Navy radar systems. And all of those design and manufacturing experiences have blended into the kind of equipment we build. We build very robust equipment with very, very high quality components, the highest component, quality components that are available in the marketplace. Um, one of the interesting experiences, and, I, and I'll kind of touch on this again, um, was with NASA and designing and building the uh, communications and tracking equipment because there are human interfaces on that equipment, just like there are human interfaces on our audio equipment. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute and we'll talk about that. Um, some of my interests um, that we may have in common are um, amateur radio. I'm a ham radio operator and I restore and rebuild and have built um, a number of pieces of vacuum tube um, radio communications equipment. And I'm actually going to take you on a tour of some of the equipment I've restored and rebuilt um, in one of our future podcasts. So you can see um, what some of the design influences are in my life. Um, I also uh, am a licensed pilot. I, uh, I have an airplane, single engine airplane, but I'm a private pilot. I'm a commercial pilot. Um, I'm an instrument rated pilot. Um, most of my time has been in single engine aircraft, although I have spent some time in Learjets um, flying uh, commercial customers. So it's a passion of mine. And again, reliability and robust equipment design kind of comes into play there. Um, I like bourbon and I like analog watches. Um, and I like to read. I'm kind of a voracious reader, and I'm a news junkie. So we might end up talking about politics somewhere along the way in here. Um, in terms of design philosophies, um, I, I, the primary factor um, in my design philosophy as we design and build audio equipment is analog reproduction. Um, I'm a believer that the finest audio reproduction can only be done with analog reproduction. And, and there's actually some, some science in that that drives that. Um, I mentioned to you that we designed and built the communications and tracking equipment for the NASA space station. And one of the poignant experiences I had was we were doing a design review down at the Johnson Space Center with NASA engineers and astronauts. And we were lectured by a human factors engineer who was in the audience. And that a human factors engineer is an engineer who designs push buttons, so that they have tactile feedback, so that when you're in a capsule that's dark and wet and you've got to fire that retro rocket, that button you push to fire the retro rocket clicked under your finger, so you knew you actuated it. There was no question about that. And they designed those human interfaces. And he lectured us that human beings are analog. They're analog beings by nature. Our ears, our eyes are analog devices. So the interface to the human being must be analog. And that's kind of driven my design philosophy when it comes to audio equipment. Um, the, the digital uh, electronics have come an extremely long way. We use digital electronics all the time in our shows, in our shop. Um, it has not only brought much high, higher quality uh, reproduction, but it has also brought us a tremendous amount of content. So much content, uh, as a matter of fact, that I think in some of the younger generation, content is starting to repro uh, replace quality in reproduction, which is a concern for us. Um, but uh, the, the ears have the ability to discern infinitesimally small variations in amplitude, and they can only be reproduced in an analog format. 
I, the, this, the digital sampling rates have gotten higher and higher, the digital bandwidths have gotten higher, and they're using much larger numbers to define each sample period. But still, the, with the complex waveforms associated with musical instruments and voices, some of that is lost um, in that digitization process. So when it comes to higher quality listening, our preference is towards analog reproduction. So all our gear has an analog reproduction uh, core to it. We also design almost exclusively using vacuum tubes. Some of our newer amplifiers, the control electronics have processors in them. Um, you can't avoid that. We use iPad interfaces for controls. You can't have an iOS platform with vacuum tubes. You just can't do it. Um, but none of the audio that's reproduced in our amplifiers runs through those semiconductor junctions. They all run through vacuum tubes. And why? Because vacuum tubes have a very unique sound. I'm, I'm careful not to say that they sound better or worse than semiconductor devices. Um, it's very much like wine or bourbon. It's a matter of taste. Um, but vacuum tubes do have a very unique sound. And we enjoy that sound. I enjoy that sound. And a large number of our followers enjoy that sound as well. And <clears throat> I actually did a paper um, that was printed in Copper Magazine as to why vacuum tubes have a unique sound, and we can actually talk about that in a podcast if you like. Again, I want to encourage you to write to me with your topics um, and questions. Info at Rogers High Fidelity, Roger at Rogers High Fidelity, or our online chat function on our website. But please give us some feedback, give us some topics that you'd like to see covered. Um, Manufacturing philosophy, I believe in building the most robust equipment um, that, that we can build. I'm a believer in U.S.-based manufacturing. I think the United States has the ability to reproduce and manufacture the finest quality equipment um, that the world has to offer. Um, we demonstrate that every day, um, and uh, we can do that through component selection, training, and industrial engineering processes that drive our manufacturing process. So again, my, my manufacturing philosophy has been use the highest quality components and build the best products that you can build. Um, I had mentioned one of my interests was amateur radio. Um, there was a company called Collins Radio. It's actually still in existence today as Rockwell Collins. But from the 20s to the 70s, they built the best communications equipment um, that the world ever saw. And it was run by a gentleman named Arthur Collins, and he's been very influential in my engineering career. Never met the man, um, but in terms of reading about their design philosophy, firsthand experience with their equipment, it, I have equipment and radios that were built by Collins Radio in the 50s that today operate like the day they came off the manufacturing line. And the reason for that is because they were built extremely well using the best components that are available. And we've taken that design philosophy put it into our equipment, which is why we offer a lifetime warranty. Um, we like to say your kids will fight over our, air, our amplifiers when you're gone. Um, so they're ultimately serviceable because they're built with good quality components and they're built with the best, the best products and the best components that are available. As an example, um, all our chassis are aviation grade aluminum. Most chassis today for audio equipment are made in, with steel. Um, there are, there are technical issues, why steel is not good, the way it affects transformer magnetics, um, but most importantly, aviation grade aluminum will last forever. It will literally last forever. And it's more expensive, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's uh, more difficult than the machine shops are, uh, are more important that you get a higher quality machine shop that can work with that, um, but we believe in using aviation grade aluminum for all our chassis work. So, in a nutshell, that's a little bit about me, a little bit about my design philosophy and my background. Again, please write to us with topics that you'd like to see covered um, and uh, questions that you may have. We're going we're gonna to talk about some interesting topics. We're going to talk about power measurements. Why are power measurements important in audio? We're going to talk about vacuum tubes, why they sound the way they do. Um, so, a lot of things we're going to talk about, they don't have to be exclusively technical issues. Um, and we're going to bring on some special guests to talk about things that are completely outside of the technical arena. So thanks again for watching and uh, send me your comments.